speaker is the Attorney General. William Barr is the 77th and 85th Attorney General of the United States. <laughs> the last and only other time someone served twice in the office was in the 1840s and 50s when John J. Critton of Kentucky served as the 15th and 22nd Attorney General. No one else has seen fit to do it twice. <laughs> Mr. Barr received his A.D. in government from Columbia University in 1971 and his M.A. in government and Chinese studies in 1973. From 1973 to 1977, he served in the Central Intelligence Agency before receiving his J.D. with high honors, highest honors from George Washington University Law School in 1977. He then began a most distinguished career in the law that has included both private practice and public service at the highest levels. He clerked for Judge Malcolm Wilkie on the D.C. Circuit and then joined the Shaw Pittman Law Firm in the District of Columbia. He served briefly in the Reagan administration on the domestic policy staff and then returned to private practice. In 1989, he joined the Bush administration as the Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy of the Council. From there, he eventually became the Deputy Attorney General and then Attorney General of the United States at the young age of 41. From 1994 to 2000, Mr. Barr served as Executive Vice President and General Counsel for GPD Corporation and then as EVP and General Counsel of Verizon from 2000 to 2008, and since 2008, and until, and until his appointment as Attorney General, Mr. Barr has practiced law and consulted with clients on regulatory matters. In February 2019, he was confirmed by the Senate as the 85th Attorney General. I knew and admired Attorney General Barr from my own time in the Department of Justice as a U.S. Attorney when he was the Deputy. I knew him to be exceptionally gifted, perceptive, and dedicated, with a wonderful sense of humor. Therefore, immediately upon his confirmation, and relying upon the ALI's long-standing tradition of inviting the Attorney General to speak, and then the good offices of my son William, who was working for the Attorney General, <laughs> I, I asked whether the Attorney General would address us this evening. I gave him several options. To lighten the burden, I suggested that he could give a light burden talk if he wished to, or he could speak on the topic of his choosing. The response came back, uh, and it was no surprise. In honor of the important work of the American Law Institute, Mr. Barr would speak on a substantial matter of legal policy. His talk tonight addresses the relationship of the restatement of consumer contracts to the UCC. <laughs> Also address nationwide injunctions. It's my, <laughs> my great honor to welcome the Attorney General of the United States to the American Law Institute.
first uh, exercises of my powers as Attorney General was walking into the office of his former Chief of Staff, who's now head of the Criminal Division, Brian Benjikowski, and directed that he surrender the portrait of uh, Mike McCase that he had in his office so I could have it in my office <laughs> to inspire me every day and, and uh, to, to remind me of his example. Um, my life has obviously changed a lot in the, in the last few months. Um, my daughter said to me, my youngest daughter, who was an AUSA in DC working for Jesse, well, in Jesse Liu's office now. Uh, she said to me, uh, Pop, you're the only guy I know who you know, one day can be sitting on the couch in your underwear with a remote control and yelling at the television, and the next day you're all over the television. <laughs> The day before I was announced, uh, which was December 7th, <laughs> she was getting married on December 8th, and we had been planning on doing it the following week, because we'd been sitting on this for a long time. And on December 7th, I got a call from the president saying, hey, Bill, I'm walking out. I know you could, we could wait till next week. I know your daughter's getting married tomorrow. I'm walking out to the helicopter, I'd just like to do it today if it was okay. I said, it's fine with us, but it's fine. So he announced it on December 7th. Um, that's when I was uh, welcoming people at the wedding, I said, you know, my daughter, the same daughter said to me, Pop, you're the only father I know who would upstage his yeah. daughter. <laughs> and I said, well, Meg, look at it this way, you know, just before the bar name is going to be dragged through the mud, you're changing your name to to McGoy. <laughs> I know my friend and former law partner, uh, Dave Rubenstein, I think spoke last year, is that right, or recently, and he gave a very lighthearted speech at the end. And so I, I, thought, I wanted to follow his example, so I picked the topic that I thought would lend itself to my heart and truth. And uh, that's uh, nationwide injunctions. <laughs> Um, the central, as, you, as we all know, the central genius of the, the American Constitution lies in its use of structure to protect individual liberty. Uh, it does not rely solely or even primarily on the grant of substantive rights. As Justice Scalia used to quip, every banana republic has its bill of rights. His point and, and mine is that the bulwark against tyranny <coughs> In America has always been our structure of government, most notably the separation of powers. These days, clashes between Congress and the executive seal the headlines, as uh, I know very well. But clashes between the judiciary and the political branches are also very weighty. And while the framers uh, had concerns about the unelected judiciary encroaching on the, uh, the prerogatives of the political branches, Hamilton promised in the Federalist 78 that the least democratic branch would also be the least dangerous branch because courts have, quote, no influence over either the sword or the purse, neither force nor will, but merely judgment. Today, that assurance doesn't instill much confidence. We have seen over time an expansion of judicial willingness to review executive action. And then, Combine that with the strategies of sophisticated public interest lawyers and the growing use of nationwide injunctions. And the legal community and the broader public should be more concerned, particularly about this trend of nationwide injunctions. Tonight, I'd like to discuss some of the reasons why. And let me start with perhaps the most remarkable example, the ongoing litigation for DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. You all know the basic backstory. It starts with the Dream Act, which would provide legal status to certain aliens who came to the United States as minors. Congress never passed that statute. But in, in 12, 2012, the Obama administration announced the DACA program, under which the DHS assumed a non-enforcement posture and extended work authorization to those covered by the proposed Dream Act. That policy was controversial. It, it used prosecutorial discretion to implement 
and unenacted in the statute, and many argue that it exceeded executive authority. Several states, led by Texas, obtained a nationwide injunction uh, against the uh, extended version of that policy, which equally divided Supreme Court affirmed, and, and they then threatened to challenge DACA itself. But in 2017, the Trump administration announced that it would wind down DACA. That decision was also controversial, though no one had seriously contended that DACA would be required by law, since it was based on the exercise of discretion. Two district judges in California and New York nevertheless issued nationwide injunctions against the rescission that is effectively requiring the government to reinstate the non-enforcement policy in DACA, notwithstanding the president's contrary exercise of his discretion. Appeals have been ongoing for nearly two years and a half, but the injunctions remain in place. This saga highlights a number of troubling consequences of the rise of nationwide injunctions. First, these injunctions have frustrated presidential policy for most of the president's term with no clear end in sight. We're more than halfway through the president's term, and the administration has not been able to rescind the signature immigration initiative of the previous administration, even though it rests entirely on executive discretion. The Justice Department has tried for more than a year to get the Supreme Court to review the lower court decisions uh, ordering us to keep DACA in place, but the court has not granted any of those requests, and they languish uh, on the conference docket. Unless the court acts quickly and decisively, we are unlikely to see a decision before mid-2020 at the earliest, and that is right before the next election. It's hard to imagine a clearer example of the stakes of nationwide injunctions. Second, these injunctions have injected the courts into the political process. The first injunction from the Northern District of California came down on January 9th, 2018, in the middle of high-profile legislative discussions. Hours earlier that day, President Trump had allowed cameras in the cabinet room to broadcast his negotiations with bipartisan leaders from both houses of Congress over the Dream Act border security, and broader immigration reform. And most people at that point thought that all the pieces of a grand compromise were on the table, which would involve, on one hand, uh, concessions on the Green Act, and on the other, uh, increased border security. But of course, once the district court forced the executive branch to maintain the docket nationwide for the indefinite future, the president was virtually all the leverage in negotiations with congressional leaders who wanted him to maintain DACA nationwide. Unsurprisingly, the negotiations collapsed. And so what do we have as a result of this uh, exercise of power by a single district court judge? We have dreamers who have been in limbo since then. The political process has been preempted, and we've had over a year of bitter, bitter political division in this country, including a shutdown of Length. Meanwhile, the humanitarian crisis on the southern border persists while legislative efforts remain frozen, both sides awaiting the court's word on DACA. Third and finally, these nationwide injunctions inspire unhealthy litigation tactics. Last May, Texas and others sued for a nationwide injunction against DACA policy, in essence, to enjoin the government from complying with other nationwide injunctions. <laughs> These states were fighting fire with fire. And for their attorney generals as advocates, that was understandable. But if we consider how things ought to work, it is also perverse. Rather than an order orderly process of litigation in which the government loses some cases and wins others with issues percolating their way through the appellate courts, we have an interdistrict battle fought with all or nothing consequences. Fortunately, Judge Hannon spared us the pain of dueling injunctions Unfortunately, however, the new status quo of DACA policy is uh, supported only by an injunction uh, persists. While DACA cases provide a stark example of the trend in nationwide injunctions at this point, it is hardly an outlier. The, 
department's best estimate is that throughout the entire 20th century, 27 nationwide injunctions were issued. They started in 1963. Since President Trump took office, federal courts have issued 37 nationwide injunctions against the executive branch. That's more than one a month. By comparison, President Obama's first two years, uh, in, in his first two years, district courts had issued two nationwide injunctions. Now, some say this would prove that the Trump administration is lawless. Obviously, I, I disagree with that. And I would point out that the only case litigated on the merits in the Supreme Court, the so-called travel ban, ended with the president's policy being upheld. But my aim today is not to debate the merits of any particular policy. It is to discuss the improper use of nationwide injunctions against policies of all stripes. Specifically, aside from the particular oddities of the DACA case, I want to highlight five ways in which nationwide injunctions are inconsistent with our American legal system. First and most fundamentally, nationwide injunctions violate the separation of powers. Article III vests federal courts with the judicial power to decide cases or controversies. As the Supreme Court has instructed, that means concrete disputes among individual parties. In the words of Chief Justice Marshall in Marbury v. Madison, the province of the court is solely to decide on the rights of individuals, not to inquire how the executive perform their duties in which they have discretion. This limitation grows in part out of the English system of equity, which limited relief in a given case to the parties before the court. As explained by ALI's first restatement of judgments published in 1942, the English equity system was a system of personal justice. As Professor Samuel Bray wrote, this means that an injunction would restrain the defendant's conduct vis-a-vis -vis the plaintiff, not vis-a-vis -vis the world. This inherited tradition from the English courts is not just a matter of inertia. It is baked into Article III's vesting of federal courts with the judicial power to resolve cases or controversies. As Justice Scalia succinctly put it, the judicial power, as Americans have understood it, and their English ancestors before them, is the power to adjudicate with conclusive effect disputed government claims, civil or criminal, against private persons, and disputed claims by private persons against the government or other private persons. Justice Frankfurter likewise described Article III as providing merely the outlines of what were, in the founding generation, the familiar operations of the English judicial system. Consistent with that understanding, federal courts do not appear to have issued any nationwide injunctions during the first 175 years of the Republic. As I said, the first documented case is the D.C. Circuit case in 1963. And that absence of nationwide injunctions does not reflect an unwillingness to issue injunctions against the government. Quite the contrary, in 1937, Attorney General Homer Cummings issued stating that lower courts had issued thousands of injunctions against New Deal programs. But in keeping with the English tradition and two centuries of American law, those injunctions bound the government only with respect to the parties in those cases. The government continued to enforce New Deal programs against others in many cases. Even then, the subsequent Attorney General, Robert Jackson, described the judiciary's re reaction and the use of injunctions to challenge New Deal programs as a reckless partisan and irresponsible. I can only imagine what he would think today when they go down uh, nationwide. The novel approach taken by some districts over the past few years reflects a departure, not only from the historical limitations of Article III, but also from our traditional understanding of the role of courts. Courts issuing nationwide injunctions often describe themselves as striking down a law. Although we have probably all used that term as a shorthand, the truth is that courts do not have authority to strike down laws. In our system, they resolve only disputes between parties, and as the Supreme Court explained almost a century ago in Massachusetts versus Mellon, a court may enjoin not the execution of the statute, but the 
the acts of the official. And as one commentator has explained, the court has no power to issue a writ of erasure striking down a statute from the books. This might sound like a semantic point, but it goes to the heart of the problem. Courts at the founding understood their role as addressing only the rights of the parties, and if they disregarded a statute or executive policy in the name of judicial review, it was only because they were bound to apply the higher law of the Constitution. But today, the acts of a, one, uh, the, a judge issuing a nationwide injunction acts as a one-man or one-woman council of revision. The second aspect of it, uh, of uh, nationwide injunctions, that's inconsistent with our American legal system, is that it inflates the role of the individual ju justice, uh, district court judge within the judicial structure. The Constitution empowers Congress to create lower federal courts, and in designing a system of 93 judicial districts and 12 regional circuits, Congress set clear ge geographical limits on lower courts jurisdiction. In our system, district court rulings do not bind other judges, even other judges in the same district. This system has many virtues. It creates checks and balances within the judiciary itself, and it encourages what former D.C. Circuit uh, Judge Howard, uh, Howard Leventhal called percolation, the process by which many lower courts offer their views on legal issues before higher courts resolve them. This process of percolation is not just a good idea, it's a, it's a very embodiment of our common law tradition. In that great tradition, governing legal principles emerge from a scattershot of precedent that involve multiple cases over many years, cited by multiple judges working through legal issues and refining their views. When a nationwide injunction issues against the government, it short circuits that process. Because such injunctions prevent enforcement against anyone, anywhere, they overshadow related litigation in other courts. After all, even if the government prevails in every other case, a nationwide injunction still prevents all enforcement of the law. It, it thus gives a single judge the unprecedented power to render irrelevant the decisions of every other jurisdiction in the country. This is not a hypothetical occurrence. In litigation over the president's policy on transgender military service, the government won a victory in the D.C. Circuit. Yet because district courts in California and Washington had enjoined the policy nationwide, the D.C. Circuit's decision has no practical effect. The government could not implement the policy until the Supreme Court acted. That is not the only example. The Ninth Circuit recently ordered a briefing on whether a nationwide injunction from Pennsylvania District Court mooted the appeal of an injunction from within the Ninth Circuit. Giving a single district court judge such outsized power is irreconcilable with the stru structure of our judicial system. It not only allows district courts to wield unprecedented power, it also allows district court to wield it asymmetrically. When a, when a court denies a nationwide injunction, the decision does not affect other cases. But when a court grants a nationwide injunction, it renders all other litigation on the issue largely irrelevant. Think about what this means for the government. When Congress passes a statute or the, or the president implements a policy that is challenged in multiple courts, the government has to run the table. We must win every case. The challenge, however, just find that one district court judge out of the available 600 willing to enter a nationwide injunction. One judge can, in effect, cancel the policy with a stroke of the pen. Even the Chief Justice of the United States must convince at least four other justices to bind the federal government nationwide. Third, nationwide injunctions undermine public confidence in the judiciary. When a single judge can freeze policies nationwide, it's not hard to predict what plaintiffs will do. In, judge, in Professor Bray's memorable phrase, they shop until the statute drops. Requests for nationwide injunctions thus flooded Texas district courts during the Obama administration, while similar requests have landed in California and New York during the Trump administration. 
I'm not here to question any judge's motivation, but even assuming all good faith, the appearance of form, form shopping is ins inescapable and damaging to the ideal of an impartial judiciary. The consequences will be far-reaching and could include politicizing the district court confirmation process in ways similar to what we have seen for the courts of appeal and the Supreme Court, and none of us should want that to happen. Fourth, nationwide injunctions create unnecessary and unhelpful emergencies. When a nationwide injunction constrains a significant executive policy, the Justice Department has little choice but to seek emergency relief. No one benefits from emergency litigation, not the government, not the plaintiffs, not the courts, not the American people. But the alternative is for a government to wait months or years for appeals to run their course before the executive may implement its policies at all. Finally, nationwide injunctions conflict with the litigation system that Congress, that, that Congress has chosen as a mechanism for aggregate litigation. One of the few potential defenses of nationwide injunctions is that they promote uniformity. Of course, we value uniformity in our legal system, but we already have ways to achieve it, usually through review by the Supreme Court on a writ of certiorari after an issue has percolated through the lower courts. When the Supreme Court issues a nationwide ruling in that posture, we have more confidence it is due to the preceding efforts in the lower courts. Nationwide injunctions turn that process on its head, and they treat the first case like it is the last case. I mean, after all, why do we have three judges on the intermediate appellate level and then nine justices on the Supreme Court? It's because of the significance of that last decision by the Supreme Court adopting a uniform rule for the country. Congress and the Federal Rules Committee have also designed mechanisms for aggregate litigation where appropriate, but none authorizes nationwide injunctions. Consider Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 23, which allows plaintiffs to bring class actions on behalf of unnamed parties, sometimes across the nation. Still, they must meet a series of procedural and substantive requirements, including that class members share typical claims and that the named plaintiffs will adequately represent the members of the class. The rules also provide, in many cases, for absent class members to receive notice of the action and the opportunity to opt out. Members of the class are also generally bound by the district court's judgment and precluded from relitigating in different courts. Nationwide injunctions do not work that way. To end where I began, I raised the problem of nationwide injunctions as a matter not of partisanship but of the rule of law. One can easily imagine a future administration's policy, say on climate change or employee rights, freezing 